books of poetry and criticism, The Solving School, Being Property Once Myself, Ode, and The Study of Human Life. Earlier this year, he received not only a Guggenheim Fellowship in American Literature, but simultaneously a Whiting Award for poetry and nonfiction. Joshua's writing has been published in the New York Times, the Paris Review, Poetry Magazine, and the Best American Poetry. He currently lives in Boston, Massachusetts with his wife, Pam, and his very young son, August, and their animal, animal companion, Apollo 5. Thank you for being here, Josh. Of course. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, and thank you to all the organizers of this conference, and especially, again, Professor Scary in particular for the invitation, as well as her continued mentorship and generosity. So today I'll be sharing a suite of poems uh, that speak not only to the particular geopolitical concerns that have already been broached at today's conference, but to the ways that those concerns have long been braided into the literary traditions of writers from across the African diaspora, particularly those living and working in the United States. The work of Vincent J. Ntandi, whose book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement, has been absolutely indispensable to my own thinking on this front. And Tandi writes, inside Black communities, pastors, poets, intellectuals, artists, and musicians condemned the atomic bombings and immediately criticized Truman's decision to use nuclear weapons. Many of these men and women were not lifelong peace activists. And for the first time, they began to view colonialism, racism, and the bomb as links in the same chain. African Americans were among the first to envision what historian Peter Kuznick refers to as the apocalyptic narrative. These aforementioned writers included, but were not limited to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B. Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and Lorraine Hansberry, among others. So in that vein, the opening triptych of the poems I will read were written by one of our truly great nature poets, Lucille Clifton. The first is a persona poem at Nagasaki. The second is entitled, The Beginning of the End of the World. It takes up the apocalyptic narrative and employs it toward radical ends, staging an encounter between humans and cockroaches on the cusp of nuclear war. The third is the last day and imagines human life in the wake of global catastrophe. One, at Nagasaki. In their own order, the things of my world glisten into ash. I have done nothing to deserve this, only been to the silver birds what they have made me, nothing. The beginning of the end of the world. Maybe the morning the roaches walked into the kitchen, bold <laughs> with their bad selves, marching up out of the drains, not like soldiers, like priests, grim and patient in the sink. And when we ran the water, trying to drown them as if they were soldiers, they seemed to bow their sad heads for us, not at us, and march single file away. Maybe then, the morning we rose from our beds, as always, listening for the bang at the end of the world. Maybe then, when we heard only the tiny tapping and saw them dark and prayerful in the kitchen. Maybe then, when we watched them turn from us, faithless at last, and walk in a long line away. The last day. We will find ourselves surrounded by our kind, all of them now, wearing the eyes they had only imagined possible. And they will reproach us with those eyes in a language more actual than speech asking why we allowed this to happen, asking why, for the love of God, we did this to ourselves, and we will answer in our feeble voices, because, because, because. So the final poem I'll read uh, is taken from Sea to Shining Sea, and it was written by the Black feminist poet and essayist June Jordan. It takes up concerns similar to those reflected in the Clifton poems, but it lives in a world before what Clifton calls the bang at the end. A world where we still have the opportunity to think about a different way things might go if we are brave. 
I'll be reading from the fifth and seventh sections of the poem and then offer a bit of critical commentary to close out my time. From sea to shining sea. This was not a good time to live in Queens. Trucks carrying explosive nuclear waste will exit from the Long Island Expressway and then travel through residential streets and route to the 59th Street Bridge and so on. This was not a good time to live in Arkansas. Occasional explosions caused by mystery nuclear missiles have been cited as cause for local alarm, among other things. This was not a good time to live in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Given the presence of a United States nuclear missile base in Grand Forks, North Dakota, the non-military residents of the area feel that they live only a day-to-day -day distance from certain annihilation, etc. This was not a good time to be a tree. This was not a good time to be a river. This was not a good time to be found with a gun. This was not a good time to be found without one. This was not a good time to be gay. This was not a good time to be Black. This was not a good time to be a pomegranate or an orange. This was not a good time to be against the natural order. Wait a minute. I am turning under the trees. I am trailing blood into the rivers. I am walking loud along the streets. I am digging my nails and my heels into the land. I am opening my mouth. I am just about to touch the pomegranates piled up precarious. This is a good time. This is the best time. This is the only time to come together, fractious, kicking, spilling, burly, whirling, raucous, messy, free, exploding like the seeds of a natural disorder. Jordan coins a new phrase, natural disorder, to describe the coalition of figures she assembles at poem's end. Human and non-human, living and non-living, river and tree and pomegranate, all gathered together under the same banner. All of these named actors persist in what she calls a certain day-to-day -day distance from annihilation and are on this basis alone, imagined as existing in a kind of agonizing, astonishing solidarity. Across borders of experience and opacity, there exists the chance for not only collaboration, but truly revolutionary action. Jordan reminds us that our present conditions are not without precedent, and that just as sure as our worst fears can only be defeated once they are reckoned with and imaginatively engaged, we likewise need not think that we are without the instruments we need in order to survive and to craft a more capacious vision of our shared vulnerable world anew. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. 